Good afternoon and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. Apologies have been received today from Tavish Scott, MSP. Our main item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 negotiations. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses, the Right Honourable David Mundell, MP, Secretary of State for Scotland, and Robin Walker, MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary at the Department for Exiting the European Union. Uh, welcome to both of you. And I'd like to invite the Secretary of State to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Convener, and thank you for the invitation to uh, be here today with my colleague, the Parliamentary uh, Under Secretary of State for Exiting the European Union. We're pleased to be appearing before this committee, as I believe it is an important part of engagement between the UK Government and Scottish Parliament, and this is an opportunity for me to hear uh, your views directly. As members of this committee will be aware, last Thursday I appeared before the Scottish Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to discuss the EU Withdrawal Bill. I hope my appearance provided a useful opportunity for those committees and MSPs to consider the revised approach to Clause 11 of the EU Withdrawal Bill. The appearance gave me the opportunity to clarify a number of issues as the committee considered that bill. However, I am aware that this committee has a different remit and therefore a different focus. I am looking forward to hearing from members of the committee on our preparations for the UK to leave the EU. It is important that both the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are able to share with the UK Government their views on EU exit. And I look forward to discussing the UK Government's thoughts and positions with this committee, albeit recognising that we are still negotiating our exit from the EU. Through the JMCEN, we are making good progress on agreeing a formal process for the Scottish Government to feed into the EU negotiations. We are proposing a two-tiered approach to increase involvement of the devolved administrations in negotiations. This approach was discussed at the JMCEN on the 2nd of May and includes the creation of a new ministerial forum within the architecture of the JMCEN and a formal process to enhance official level engagement. We have proposed that the new ministerial forum be co-chaired by my colleague here, Robin Walker, and Chloe Smith, Minister for Constitution at the Cabinet Office. We expect the forum to meet regularly and to follow the rhythm of negotiations so as to make sure the right discussions can take place in advance of those negotiations. On the technical discussions, we have proposed joint UK devolved administration technical working groups to consider specific issues related to the negotiations. The key point of this proposal is to create clear mechanisms through which devolved administrations feed into the negotiations. To ensure this process is efficient and as effective as possible, the co-chairing ministers will provide a detailed update in advance of the JMCEN. The minutes of the meeting will also be circulated to UK Cabinet ministers so this information can directly inform the Cabinet level discussions on the UK's negotiating position. We are looking forward to further progress on these matters and to working closely with the Scottish Government in this forum. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mundell. Mr Mundell, last week you appeared, as you said, before this Parliament's uh, Finance and Constitution Committee, and the convener of that committee, uh, Bruce Crawford, MSP, asked you whether the UK Government would proceed with the EU Withdrawal Bill, even if this Parliament withheld legislative consent from that bill. I think it's fair to say that you didn't at that time give Mr Crawford a definite answer to his questions, but you did say that you very much hoped that the Parliament would give its consent and that you believed that the Finance and Constitution's uh, report, uh, the committee's report on the LCM, would, in your words, be very influential in informing people's views. Now, the Finance and Constitution Committee has now published its report on the supplementary LCM just 10 minutes ago, and I realise that there isn't much notice. Um, 
the conclusion of that report says that the Parliament should refuse to give legislative consent to the EU withdrawal bill unless Clause 11 is dropped. So I wondered now if you could tell this committee whether the UK Government will uh, go ahead and impose uh, the withdrawal bill on the Scottish Parliament. Obviously, I haven't had the same level of access to the committee report uh, as you have, but I look forward uh, to, to reading it because I know that committee does take uh, its work uh, very conscientiously and I, I look forward to reading it in detail uh, and I'm sure uh, that will be the case for colleagues. However, my position remains the same as it was when I appeared before uh, that committee. The decision as to whether legislative consent is given for the bill is a decision for this parliament, for all members uh, of uh, this parliament. And I'm not going to preempt uh, that decision. I hope that there is still time, firstly, uh, for us to be able to reach an agreed position with the Scottish Government uh, on uh, the bill. I think everybody accepts that that is the best outcome. And I hope that when parliament does come uh, to consider the bill and when it reflects on all the evidence available, including maybe some of the evidence that's delivered to this committee today, that it will uh, give that consent. You, you will be aware that the Parliament will make that consideration on Tuesday and will make a decision on the LCM on Tuesday, so you do not have very much time. Uh... I, I, know we don't have, I, I know we don't have much time. I, you know, we're, we're up against really the wire now, but many of these negotiations of this type, negotiations in the uh, European uh, Union, for example, always seem to go right to that very uh, wire. Uh, we are open to further uh, discussion. David Liddington, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who uh, oversees the, the constitutional arrangements in the Cabinet Office, will be in Scotland uh, tomorrow. He uh, has made clear, as I have, our ministerial colleagues, our door is still open. We still want uh, to continue uh, to engage with the Scottish Government because we believe that if we are able to uh, reach agreement, as we were with the Welsh uh, Assembly Government, that is the best outcome. So if you do not reach agreement uh, before Tuesday, will you be imposing this uh, piece of legislation? on the Scottish Parliament against its will, if the Scottish Parliament what, rejects what, it? What I'll be doing is continuing in, in the time uh, left to try and secure agreement. I'll also be trying through this appearance and, and uh, more generally to make clear why uh, we think that the arrangements put forward within uh, the bill as amended in the House of Lords are a good uh, deal for Scotland, that they respect uh, the devolution settlement and provide a way to move forward in respect of this unanticipated situation at the time of devolution of leaving uh, the EU and that on reflection a majority of members of this parliament will be, feel able uh, to give consent and that's what my focus will be. Yeah. Well, a majority of members of the Finance and Constitution Committee um, believe the only dissenters were members of your own party have said that unless Clause 11 uh, is removed, that this Parliament should not give consent. Well, my experience of this Parliament is that individual members of this Parliament take their responsibilities very seriously, whilst, uh, as I've said, I'm sure uh, uh, the report will be very uh, will have been done with uh, the usual rigour uh, of uh, that committee. It will be uh, for individual members of the Parliament to decide. And in fact, uh, as I think I've said here before, I certainly said it in other forums, the you know, Scottish Government have always been very, very clear this was not a decision for them. It was a decision for uh, this Parliament. And so uh, that's uh, what you know, will inform I, uh, the, so, the, yeah. the process. So I'll ask you one more, t more time. It's a decision for this Parliament. The, the committee's report would certainly indicate that this Parliament will not give its uh, consent uh, to the, uh, the legislative consent motion. So are you going to impose uh, the, the legislation on this Parliament? I'm not going to preempt Parliament. I respect this Parliament. I respect the debate that you'll have uh, next uh, Tuesday. I have a supplementary from Richard Walker. Just on, on the issue of Richard, <coughs> Richard Lockhead. the decision that the Parliament will shortly have to take here, uh, you said that there may be a third way required to get through this dispute. 
Uh, can you elaborate on what you believe the third way to be, given that the clock is ticking? I've said as well, I think, that I didn't, I, 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 it wasn't obvious to me what a third way was, because there are a number of aspects of the agreement. In, for example, the terms of the clause, you know, the, the wording of the clause, the wording of the intergovernmental agreement and the MOU. But the position as set out by the First Minister appears to me to be a position which is that, that uh, the Scottish Government doesn't agree with that approach at all. So it's not, for example, about uh, having a discussion about how long the sunset clause should be, because my understanding is that the Scottish Government approach is that the, that, that the very approach of the clause is not the right one. I, uh, but if I'm wrong on that, then obviously I am very happy to be uh, corrected. Thank you. Claire Baker. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, thank you, convener. Um, it might be helpful um, if the Secretary of State, because there's I'm not sure that I that there's what was what's been raised with this previously is that there's two cultures at play here, and there's maybe not a clear understanding with the UK government how devolution works, or the understanding that we have here is a different way of how it works. So, do you think there is an understanding at the moment uh, between governments on what the issues are, an understanding of where the Scottish Parliament is coming from and why it's having difficulty with the LCM? And could you outline what you understand those to be? I. Um I think that you know, we, we have sought to set out our, our position in, in, in relation to this matter. I, I mean, I'm very disappointed that we're in this position because for me, it's, it's a pinhead constitutional argument that we're in. We've agreed, the Scottish Government, UK Government have agreed 24 areas where we think after we leave the EU should stay exactly as they are, exactly as they're regulated at the moment. Uh, and uh, we've agreed that, but we're now having an argument about what the formal process for agreeing it is. So we've actually agreed the substance, and we're having, we're having a, a, a debate and discussion about the formal uh, process. Now, I believe, uh, uh, as I, I think was articulated extremely well in the House of Lords uh, by uh, Lord Jim Wallace, who, after all, was one of the sort of founding fathers of this Parliament, that when devolution was, uh, um, came about in the late 90s, and this situation wasn't envisaged. So it, it, it's a we, need, we have a requirement to address a unique situation. We've come forward with a proposal which I think is reasonable to address that unique situation and which uh, your colleagues in the Welsh Government identified doesn't in any way undermine the devolution settlement. So that's... That's what we've sought to do, not interfere in any way with the existing devolution settlement and be very clear, no powers, responsibilities currently exercised in this parliament will change. Bring forward in the, in the response to this committee, the other committees, uh, the MPs, Lords uh, and others who have commented, we've brought forward a, a fundamental change to the clause to give it essentially a presumption of devolution, but we've inserted in it a basis for what should happen if there wasn't agreement. And that, that's, that appears to be uh, at the core you know, of, of, of the contention. Mm. Um, going back to, you made opening comments around the GMC and outlined a number of areas where there's been new ministerial groups established, there's been working parties established. It has been raised with us that the that over the years, the working relationship between the Scottish Parliament and the Westminster uh, Parliament and the two governments um, have has has frayed, not through in often ways not through intention, but perhaps just because of a change of personnel. The, the the architects of devolution are no longer within government, and civil servants have moved on. How important? I mean, you've outlined the new bodies being established, which are welcome but are still quite limited. Um, how do you see the relationship moving forward in, in future years and what needs to be done to, to build that? What I think is a very positive thing about what happened at the last meeting of the GMCN, and Robin was, was present as well, although we had you know, an area of disagreement with the Scottish Government, we were able to conduct a very cordial and business-like meeting. It wasn't, there was no friction you know, there was disagreement, 
but there was no friction. And I think that actually is a sign of a mature uh, relationship where you can have a disagreement. But in the same meeting that we didn't reach agreement, uh, uh, self-evidently, uh, on uh, Clause 11, we still reached agreement on the setting up of this new forum, and we reached agreement how we would take forward the work on these 24 areas that in future will will uh, have uh, frameworks. And uh, you know, I, so I felt actually there was a maturing, uh, uh, th there's been a maturing of the process. Uh, and I stand by uh, you know, my remarks at the uh, Finance and Constitution Committee. You know, I've been uh, around the block a few times and you know, I think that relationships between the two governments were most difficult uh, in uh, the early part and mid-2014 uh, mid than they are at this moment. Okay. Thank you. Supplementary? Yeah, it's really just to follow on from Claire Baker's question, because I understand what you're saying there, but I mean, we heard evidence from uh, Professor Keating, I think that was just last week, and it was about what he seemed to think was um, a lack of understanding of devolution. He said that... Uh, as Claire Baker mentioned, there's a high turnover of officials in Whitehall. Officials establish relationships with the devolved administrations and get to know people. The relationships tend to be good at the ground level, but then someone else moves in. That needs to be built more clearly into the system. Similarly, ministers in Whitehall are often insensitive in the sense that they are unaware of the devolved implications of things. They've got to learn more about that. And I think given the way that, well, we saw the GMC didn't meet for nine months last year, we had position papers put forward that are related to... Uh, devolved responsibilities without the Scottish Government or Parliament being consulted. So do you understand where this belief comes from and how would you react to that statement there? I, I certainly don't dispute that there's a need to continue to improve you know, devolution capability and understanding uh, in, in Whitehall and, and indeed more generally uh, because it is an evolving situation and you know, as we've seen but we've, we've uh, following the Scotland Bill 2016, significant more devolution, you know, has taken place. So if you'd had a, uh, you know, if if you had been set out a, a, a briefing on devolution uh, two years ago, then the situation now is is is, is different. So I think it, it is very important that people are a, uh, are kept up to date, are very, are uh, on top of the arrangements. I think it's very important that Leslie Evans, the Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government, is part of the regular meeting of Permanent Secretaries of all uh, the Whitehall departments. So at that top level, you know, you, uh, you do have uh, that level uh, of connection. People do change, a, um, a, do change, a, uh, but the, I, I think there is a good level a, of interaction between uh, the Scottish Government. I have some people who've just come from the Scottish Government uh, to work uh, for the Scotland office, and some people from the Scotland office uh, you know, have gone into the Scottish Government. So I think, yes, we can uh, do better, but I, I, I don't recognise you know, the, the bleakness, perhaps, of the situation as, uh, as suggested. I mean, well, if I might come in on this, I think uh, what we've seen, both in the, the, the JMT end discussions, um, is, and you pointed to a period in which those were not happening, which uh, obviously uh, you know, I think everyone regrets, and I think we want to make sure that, 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 that we have uh, more regular um, engagement with that. I, we, we've seen an improvement there, but also the work that's underpinned it at an official level has actually been of extraordinarily high quality, and the frameworks discussion has been led by the, the obviously the cabinet office from from our perspective um but but, but with the of officials at every level i think has, has resulted in a huge amount of agreement um between the different governments uh, as to uh, how we can work together so i think it's important to sort of pay tribute to that work but for my department, um, actually having been spun out of, if you like, the Cabinet Office and the original Cabinet Office Brexit unit, there is a real understanding of the importance of devolution. It is something which is in our D DNA. And our Permanent Secretary, um, Philip Rycroft, has come from uh, the Cabinet Office. I, I think it's fair to say one of, our, one of the things we do have to do is challenge those other Whitehall departments that perhaps aren't as used to engagement with the um, devolved administrations uh, to ensure that through this process they're doing that. And I think we, we have seen a step up in that, both in terms of the um, approach to the future partnership, where obviously the new uh, committee that I'll be chairing with Chloe Smith uh, will play an important role 
uh, there, but also in terms of the, um, the, the work that's been going on in, in PDC contingency planning of, of making sure that we are challenging all our colleagues across Whitehall uh, to, set to, to, to work with the devolved uh, administrations wherever possible. So recognise absolutely what the Secretary of State says, there's always more to do in this space, but it is very much a core part of, of our brief. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jason Carlow. Good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. The convener made reference to the Finance and Constitution report. Uh, clearly, the earlier report was one that was supported unanimously, but this report makes uh, reference to the very considerable progress that has been uh, achieved uh, during the course and welcomes many of the amendments that have actually been accepted by the UK government to the bill. It does rest on uh, Clause 11, as we know, and I just wonder, what would you say to the committee and to Parliament in support of having confidence about the arrangements now that the bill has progressed, this section of the bill has progressed through the Lords in relation to the amended Clause 11, which ought to underpin the support of it in the Parliament next week? I would have thought that perhaps, you know, rather than listening to uh, myself, who might be perceived not to necessarily uh, to be objective, uh, then, a, uh, you know, people should reflect on, on, on the um, debate which took place in the House of Lords, where you saw a number uh, of people uh, from uh, Labour members of the House of Lords uh, to Lord Jim Wallace, who I cited just now, who said, you know, this situation was not envisaged at the time of devolution. It requires a bespoke solution. The UK government has moved very significantly to try and find uh, one. Uh, it's been agreed by the Welsh uh, government and it isn't a threat to devolution and doesn't change anything about uh, the existing uh, devolution settlement. People like uh, Lord Mackay of Clash Fairn, who uh, I think is somebody who is regularly cited by uh, Mr Russell, uh, who was very clear uh, that the government has done all it could do uh, reasonably within uh, the devolved uh, arrangements to, to get a to get a way forward. So I, I would look to those people who are not, uh, you know, the principal protagonists, but respected figures within uh, Scottish and UK uh, politics, what they're saying about this. Thank you. And, and you, you've referred to the actual, as you characterise it, the atmosphere that exists between the governments in discussion as being one that, uh, where there's a difference of opinion, there has been a lack of friction. Uh, given the important business that lies ahead, are you confident that, in fact, a business-like approach to the actual issues that will require to be discussed, the framework, if I can borrow that phrase in the narrower context, for a constructive and productive representation of interests exists? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just as a supplementary to Jackson Carlos' points, um, Recommendation 51 uh, from today's report by the Finance and Constitution Committee says that it's this committee, this, the committee's view is that this commitment that common frameworks will not be imposed is contradicted by the consent decision mechanism created by the UK government's amendments to Clause 11, which would allow the UK government to proceed with regulations without the consent of the, UK, the Scottish Parliament. Uh, that's not really a matter, you, I think you referred to dancing in a constitutional pinhead. I mean, that's quite fundamental. I think, uh, if I may say so, Convener, there is, a, there is a slight misunderstanding as to, some, in some quarters, what, uh, the what the legislation says, although I haven't obviously had the opportunity to read uh, paragraph uh, 51. Uh, but what I can say is that when I was talking about the imposing of frameworks, that is what the new arrangements will be when we have, across the United Kingdom, negotiated those uh, arrangements. And that's what I've been quite clear, that new frameworks to apply once we've left the EU will not be imposed. And I am absolutely um, stand by uh, that statement. What the, what the clause does, clause 11, does, it provides a basis in relation to the 24 areas where the existing arrangements are to be frozen, as they are right now. That's what it deals with. It doesn't deal with new, uh, uh, it doesn't deal with new frameworks or how new frameworks are to be arrived at on those 24 areas. 
Richard Lockhead, supplementary. Yes, clarify that. <coughs> but surely if, say, agriculture and fishing regulations are frozen, which is your desire, they can't be frozen in time forevermore. They have to change at some point. Mm -hmm. And the Scottish Government are arguing that they cannot be changed without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Do you agree with that or not agree with that? And would you change those regulations without the consent of the Scottish Parliament? Well, I don't think that is what the Scottish, but what the Scottish uh, Government is currently arguing in the context of Clause 11. What they're arguing in the context uh, of Clause 11 is, is that a, uh, if we can't agree uh, that things stay the same, the, 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 UK government, the UK Parliament can't take the decision that they do stay the same. That's what, that's, well, that is what, in simple terms, uh, they are arguing. They're not, they're not arguing, uh, they're not arguing, they may, they, that may be a separate argument uh, uh, that but, they have, but in, in, the, the, in the context of Clause 11, Clause 11 is about whether existing arrangements, what the situation is right now, stays the same the day after we leave the EU or within the, the two-year period. And I'll just add to that, obviously, the agreement Sunsetting um, on Clause 11 powers does mean, of course, that there is going to need to be a replacement um, on those and that that will need to, to be achieved through new legislation, um, which will, um, where, where if it is a legislative framework, um, which will then uh, require the civil principles to be respected and consent to be sought if it's um, in an area of devolved competence. So I, I, I think, actually, we, we aren't talking here about the creation of new frameworks. We're talking about the maintenance of existing ones on a temporary basis. And it was one of the areas that the um, both the devolved governments uh, pressed in the negotiations around this was that there should be a clear indication of um, the, the finite nature of any clause of 11 regulations. We, we've recognised that through the um, new sunsets which have been introduced um, in the revised version of the clause. But final supplementary just to that point is, uh, if you take fishing and agriculture, they are devolved issues. The Scotland Act does not have a pile of regulations or referred to mm -hmm. which are frozen in time in 2018. They have the subjects of fisheries and agriculture. Therefore, they are devolved. And you seem to be wanting part devolution where the Parliament does not have free reign over those issues that are devolved under the Scotland Act. And all, all those areas, all those powers that are devolved remain devolved. There's no uh, effect That's what I'm on those. But those, those areas that currently sit at a European but level... But the areas are referred to as fisheries, agriculture and so mm -hmm. on. They are devolved. Well, the... the in, in the intergovernmental agreement, the agricultural areas, for example, are uh, documented in terms of, of, of the different types. So although 24 areas are cited, for example, agriculture makes up a significant uh, part. It's not just agriculture, environments makes up a significant part as well. And it doesn't just say agriculture, environment. It sets out actually what those things are. And we've been very clear, uh, I think all the governments, ev uh, even though, uh, uh, again, we haven't reached agreement, that in these deep dives that we're going into, that even if, uh, and I, I cite the example of Zootech, agriculture Zootech, which is the sort of DNA, preserving DNA of animals, um, you know, even within a, a, a sector like that, it might be found that actually some of the things wouldn't need to be uh, uh, done on a UK basis. So even if you're on the list of 24 uh, areas, it doesn't mean that every single aspect of that would, be, would, would form uh, part of uh, a framework. One thing I think that would be helpful, perhaps convenient for me to say again, which I did say at the other committee, is if we weren't able to, in the regrettable situation, we weren't able to reach agreement, we would, uh, we would abide by the agreement uh, that we have reached with the Welsh Government vis-à-vis -vis the Scottish Government. So you would impose on on the Scottish Parliament then? No, we uh, we wouldn't. Not, uh, we, I have not. I, I, I know you're Scots. very keen. I know you're very keen uh, uh, for me to say that, but I'm not going to say that because I'm going to, uh, in relation to Parliament and the legislative consent, uh, I am going to wait for Parliament's deliberations. I mean, maybe I, I misunderstood you, but you seem to be saying you seem to be saying that you would um, impose the agreement that you've reached with the Welsh government on, on the Scottish Parliament. No, I did not what, say that. What we said is that the intergovernmental agreement, which we have uh, reached with the Welsh government, um, the terms of that, the um, respect for um, the, the 
devolved administrations in that are open to um, the, the Scottish Government as to a restored Northern Ireland <coughs> executive. And I think it's very important that there is that parity of treatment across the whole of the, the constitutional settlement when it comes to these issues. Um, and that that is open whatever the um, uh, outcome going forward of, of other debates and disputes. Um, I think it's important that that is you know, the, the UK government acting in a reasonable manner, setting out um, that, that, that we will respect um, the, the role of the, the devolved administrations. Um, and uh, that, that is notwithstanding the whole uh, conversation about legislative consent, which, as you say, is for this parliament to decide. Yeah. But the amendments to Clause 11 would remain. What... Well, what the situation is, is that as I, the, the, this Parliament will have a debate on the basis of uh, the, e, the EU withdrawal bill and whether to grant legislative consent to the, uh, to the, the various provisions, and we will uh, await those deliberations, whilst in the meantime, as I've set out, seeking to uh, still get a positive outcome to any uh, vote in this Parliament That's and to great. get agreement, an agreement with the Scottish Government. Thank you. Ross Greer. Thanks, Theresa May has proposed a customs partnership option for the UK's future relationship with the European Union. Boris Johnson described that as crazy. Do you agree with the Prime Minister or the Foreign Secretary? Uh, well, perhaps I can answer this one. I mean, we, have, we have presented two options for the future customs relationship between the UK and the EU. And we we recognise the enormous benefits of having frictionless access for goods. And so this is something where I think we're in agreement um, with much of the evidence provided in Scotland's place in Europe uh, about the importance of frictionless access um, for goods. W what we're talking about is the mechanism for delivering that and for meeting our commitments uh, on no infrastructure on the Irish border, but also our commitments for a UK independent trade policy. Uh, both of these options are designed to deliver that, and the new customs partnership is one way of doing that uh, in agreement with the EU. They've raised some concerns about that, as you'll be aware. Um, the um, a highly streamlined um, version, the, the so-called MaxFAC uh, option, is another way of doing that, um, with um, both sides uh, taking steps to do that. Uh, both of these are still under consideration. They're both serious options, uh, and you know, we're looking forward to the detailed conversation on the future economic partnership getting underway so we can discuss them in more detail with our counterparts. What made the Foreign Secretary describe the partnership option as crazy? I think we will see uh, throughout this process political arguments and noises off from all sorts of parties um, to... Does the, collective um, cabinet thing. responsibility uh, not still exist? And, and I think uh, uh, there will be a collective cabinet decision on this issue. When will there be a collective cabinet decision on this issue? Because it keeps being pushed back. Well, I, I, I'm keen to see that reached uh, as soon as possible. But I think it's very important that we do um, get this decision right, that we make sure that it is one that is um, uh, one on which we can make progress um, with the other side in the negotiations as well. And, of course, at, at the stage we are at, having now reached agreement uh, on large chunks of the withdrawal agreement, having reached agreement in principle uh, on the implementation period, but the next stage is to get into the detail of those talks on the future economic partnership. That will give us the opportunity to explore some of these options in more detail. Mr. Mundell, you're a member of the Cabinet. When will the Cabinet make this decision? The, the Cabinet is, uh, at the moment, a, uh, looking at a, uh, the, the options, as we've discussed before. The Cabinet work on a committee uh, system, but the full Cabinet will make a, uh, the decision in relation to uh, this important matter, because we do recognise... When the will the decision be made? I mean, the, the, the Cabinet's well, considerations have been very well publicised by cabinet members enthusiastic to make their views known there, is there a deadline because if, if there's not a deadline i think it'd be worth just putting on the record that the cabinet has not currently set a deadline for making that decision the cabinet realizes the need to make you know make a decision uh, in uh, early course it wasn't because of the nature of the timetabling of the eu negotiations it, this was an issue that was not available to be um, discussed with the EU ahead of the uh, March uh, Council, and indeed it was very important to understand the nature of the implementation period going into uh, this next phase. I recognise uh, the need uh, to make a decision, but I also recognise the need for that decision to be right, and therefore I think it is uh, the right thing to do to get uh, further detail on uh, the options before uh, a final decision is made. Will the final decision be made before the June Council meeting, European Council meeting? I would, uh, I, I would hope that that is the case, but uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 you know, I'm not 
I'm not stating that as a de facto. We got position. there, an indicative deadline we got somewhere. Um, Mr. Walker, you mentioned that two options have been put forward, and you also mentioned that the European Union has raised concerns. The European Union has, has essentially said that both of the options currently being debated within the Cabinet are, it, some have used the, the phrase uh, unworkable, I think it's a matter of, of debate how unworkable you think they are, but the, the fundamental point of concern is around the impact on the island of Ireland and the peace process. Um, I assume the UK government is in complete agreement that any customs border on the island between Northern Ireland and the Republic would be incompatible with the peace settlement. The UK government has been very, very clear that we are absolutely committed to all of our commitments under the Good Friday Agreement. We have um, made the strong case for you know, the continuation of the common travel area, which is an example of the exceptional arrangements that exist between the, the UK and the Republic of Ireland. I'm glad that the Republic of Ireland has also made that very strong case, and, and, and that's something that's now accepted by the EU uh, side in the negotiations. Of course, as you'll be aware, there are technical um, borders between um, Northern Ireland and the Republic already in terms of excise and we're, both parties are able to deal with those in a way that doesn't put any physical infrastructure any hard stop at the border. I think what we need to ensure is that the agreement that we reach with the EU um, allows for that allows for the continuation of the unique circumstances which are there uh, in the island of Ireland and recognises the importance of the peace process and the commitments that both parties um, both international parties um, have made uh, in that regard. So Absolutely, right from the start of this process, and as a former PPS in the Northern Ireland office, I've, I've seen this very directly for myself during my um, time there. Uh, we've recognised the importance of um, maintaining uh, our commitments on um, the Irish border. Government position is absolutely clear that there will be no new physical infrastructure at, at the border. Just to, to round this uh, topic off, just a quote from a, a speech that Michelle Barney made in, in Ireland last month, just the, the final section. Uh, he said, so since we all agree that we do not want a border, and since the UK agreed to respect Ireland's place in the single market, Republic, uh, then that means goods entering Northern Ireland must comply with the rules of the single market and the customs union code. That is our logic, simple as that. Do you agree with Michelle Barney's logic? Um, I, again, there are going to be positions taken throughout these negotiations. Where I agree with Michel Barnier is where he said that um, we need to make sure that both sides are coming forward with creative and imaginative solutions to the unique circumstances um, in the island of Ireland. Uh, and that actually that means that some of the approaches that we've set out in terms of um, potential uh, outcome equivalents with, with regard to goods, but also in terms of maintaining existing north-south cooperation where it already exists and where there's already um, the uh, uh, sign-off from a power-sharing devolved uh, executive, uh, for instance, in, in phytosanitary uh, uh, arrangements. It could be an important part of the overall solution. And just uh, finally, convener, um, the European Union's proposed backstop, if, if no other agreement is made, is that Northern Ireland at least stays within the customs union. Is the UK government's position, uh, are, are, would you agree to any situation in which there is a customs frontier between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, so between Northern Irish ports and Scottish West Coast ports? I think the simple answer to that is no. Um, if this is a, a, a situation the Prime Minister has made clear, she doesn't believe any UK government uh, could commit to a, a situation in which you were creating an internal barrier um, between different parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, I think it's very important that we look at the uh, actual principles of the Good Friday Agreement, which, con which include the principle of consent. Um, that consent would not be there to separate Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. Uh, and so we need to reach an arrangement which um, the, uh, actually uh, r recognises that and recognises what we agreed in the joint report, actually, which is respect for uh, each other's legal and constitutional systems. We have to respect the single market of the European Union, but they also need to respect the internal market of the UK. So the, the alternative backstop then is the whole of the UK stays in the customs union in the event that no other agreement is reached? I, I think, as I say, we are not going to stay in the customs union because we need to have an independent trade policy, but we will. Uh, we are absolutely open and we've been very clear, and I think it's set out in our customs paper, we are uh, open to exploring customs arrangements between the UK and the EU, but allow for that frictionless movement of goods. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, afternoon gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I just I want to uh, thank uh, Mr Walker for his acknowledgement uh, regarding the, the, the poor uh, handling of uh, intergovernmental relations uh, when he spoke about the issue of devolution. I mean, the fact that devolution has been here for 19 years uh, and there are still some UK departments that actually don't fully understand uh, and, uh, and you're pushing them. So, so thank you for that acknowledgement. But I just wanted to kind of go back to the issue that, uh, that Ross Greer was touching upon there. Well, I was at the weekend, uh, Greg Clark, 
uh, it spoke about the, uh, how important it was uh, to get some type of a kind of close, uh, close uh, customs arrangement with the EU, with the EU, and he cited the three and a half thousand potential jobs that Toyota uh, would go. Uh, and uh, and Caroline Fairbairn from the CBI, she welcomed uh, Mr. Clark's comments, saying that hundreds of thousands of jobs in the UK depend on frictionless trade uh, with the EU. Now, this whole issue is so crucial for the economy going forward, uh, and the timescale is running, uh, it's running out fast, and that uncertainty that's been created and generated uh, by the UK's negotiating position is absolutely, uh, is, uh, it's quite frankly appalling, to be honest. So uh, when will uh, the UK and, the UK government, sorry, and also the EU come to an arrangement, come to uh, some type of uh, fixed uh, deal that will actually help uh, the economy and provide that certainty for business and for trading. Well, first of all, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to talk about the importance of certainty in this regard. And um, what we have already done is to reach the political agreement on an implementation period, um, which is very important with regard to providing that certainty, but to, to make very clear that there will only be one set of changes. But, um, one of the things that I know businesses, including the CBI and many other business groups, have, have raised with us as a concern is that they didn't want to see two sets of changes, one on the, the exit of the UK um, from the EU and another one um, when um, we uh, ended an implementation period or when we um, uh, established a new arrangement between us. The implementation period takes away the risk of that. It means that we can uh, agree the same arrangements will remain in place, in including um, effective um, participation in the customs union, although we will not be a member um, once we've left the, the European Union, and provides uh, some of that certainty to businesses. The next part of it is the, the importance of the frictionless movement of goods, and that's where you know, we recognise that it should be in the interests of both the UK and the EU uh, to ensure that we can continue to support the complex supply chains that exist between us. Now, there are a range of different ways of doing that, but we should start from the perspective, as the EU guidelines recognise, of zero tariffs, um, and I think it's very welcome that that is um, a, a, an element uh, in the EU guidelines that they, that, that they are seeking to, uh, to, to, to achieve that. Um, we also need to, to look at areas of um, equivalence when it comes to standards in terms of goods and mutual recognition uh, in that respect. Uh, I think some of the options that are set out in our customs paper, mutual recognition of authorised economic operators and these sides of things, could be very important uh, to the end solution here uh, as well. Um, but in the... Um, the modern world in which we live, you have international companies in automotive being an excellent example, or aerospace being another, who are moving goods from, from one jurisdiction to another on a very regular basis. They hold an enormous amount of data and information on those goods and, and how they move and, uh, and need to move. We need to ensure that our governments are able to work together between the EU and the UK uh, to support those supply chains and maintain that investment. And of course, if we look at the, the economic benefit and the risks of this, it is economic benefit and risk that cuts in both directions. Uh, and what we hear when we meet with European business groups uh, is, uh, and uh, in individual member states it is that same desire to see the maintenance of the frictionless movement of goods that we have in the UK. So I, I, I think I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be easy or, or but it's necessarily going to be quick to reach a solution on this, but I think it is fundamentally in the interests of both parties uh, to reach a solution here. And having the implementation period means that we, we have the time to do so. Um, the, the best approach will be to make sure we have as much detail agreed as possible by uh, the time that implementation period starts so the maximum amount of that time uh, can be used for putting the new arrangements in place. I mean, certainly... Uh, the Prime Minister, uh, when she gave her speech on the 2nd of March, um, there were what, five uh, key points that uh, she highlighted, one of which was it must protect people's jobs and security. Absolutely. Uh, and with the huge uncertainty uh, that, uh, that we do face, then I, I, and also the comments at the weekend, certainly uh, from uh, Greg Clark, uh, and uh, the comments from CBI to actually uh, to have some type of deal, uh, I don't see how, how there is going to be any certainty and any protection of jobs with this delay and with this, uh, with this uh, intransigent position that seems to be taken by the UK? I don't believe that it is the case that there is an intransigent position being taken by the UK. What we've seen in um, recent months is some of the issues which I think people thought would be most difficult to resolve, like the financial settlement, the um, position of citizens and so on and so forth, have been agreed. Um, we've made progress on those. We've agreed to move now on to the future economic partnership, something we were very keen to be talking about from the start. Uh, and we want to focus on where there is real mutual interest in, in reaching a deal here. I think the example you give of goods in the automotive sector is an excellent example 
of where that real mutual interest exists. The big international companies which are reporting their profits in France, in Germany, um, in other uh, EU member states um, who will benefit from, from getting a deal in this space and that's what we're driving towards. Uh, and the CBI also suggested that the customs union should remain in place unless, sorry, remain in place unless and until an alternative is ready and workable. Do you agree with the CBI? Um, I think we have to reflect on the fact that um, the UK's trade policy and membership of the customs union was an important part of the referendum debate. Um, it was something that um, you know, when we had this democratic exercise across the whole of the United Kingdom, um, people considered and debated. Uh, and that um, having an independent trade policy is one of the opportunities of this process to go out into the world and be able to um, make deals both across goods and services that could be beneficial uh, to the UK. So therefore we will not be part of the customs union. Um, what we of course need to explore is the best options for how we then manage the customs relationship between the UK and the EU to make sure that that slightly less than half of our trading goods um, that we have with the EU at the moment uh, continues to thrive. And, and that is very uh, a very important objective for the UK government. That's why it was one of the first detailed papers we, we submitted last summer. Uh, and it's why it's, it's an area it's really important that we, we get right for these negotiations. My um, final question, just in terms of uh, trading, um, it's reported at the weekend that, uh, that America wants a confident free trading Britain able to do its own deals. Surely uh, any trade deal should be done for the benefit uh, of all the citizens within the UK as compared to an America first uh, President Donald Trump? Well, absolutely. We need to make sure that all trade negotiations are focused on the interests of people in the UK. But w what I would say is that there is a real risk here um, that we had. I remember I sat on the Biz Select Committee in the House of Commons when we looked at TTIP and the TTIP negotiations that were taking place then. Um, and um, we concluded that there were, there were potentially huge benefits um, for the right deal on that. But there were real concerns about the accountability of the EU trade negotiation process there and the fact that um, the UK Parliament government did not have enough of a say in it. Um, I think the, the, there's a concern that the idea that is currently put forward by the leader of the opposition that we would stay in a customs union uh, and that the EU would give us a special say on trade policy, I'm afraid it is, is fiction. Um, is that if you were in the customs union, the EU would have the full right to do trade negotiations on our behalf with no say whatsoever, not even that amount of say that we had in the TTIP negotiations for the UK, which is one of the reasons why I think once the decision has been taken that you're leaving the EU, you do have to come out of the customs union. What we now need to do is forge a new relationship with it. Marie Gujon. I really just have a, a number of questions, Julian. It's around uh, EU citizens and the settled status of EU citizens. So I think, re well, recently we've seen a number of serious issues emerge from the Home Office. Um, we've had Amber Rudd resign over immigration targets, continuing fallout from Windrush. The families in Scotland that have been threatened with deportation mistakenly by the Home Office and the Prime Minister who allegedly blocked requests from other government departments to allow uh, doctors from overseas to enter the UK. Do you believe that the Home Office has the capacity currently to deal with the settled status applications of the over 3 million citizens that live here, which would average at about 6,000 applications a day? This is, I mean, it's incredibly important that we get the settled status scheme right and that we make uh, and that we ensure that it is a scheme which is as friendly uh, as possible to those communities who are part of our communities. Um, and uh, I have been working very closely with my colleagues at the Home Office on this. We've been holding a number of events with diaspora communities um, in, in the UK from a whole range of um, EU member states to make sure we're getting their feedback on board before the scheme is launched. And I think that's really important because I think uh, in the past, and, and I think you can some examples of or, or where there have been problems. Uh, in the past, um, some schemes on immigration have been designed to um, uh, immigration control have been designed to perhaps to uh, catch people out to, to, to find a reason why people should not be allowed to stay. The settled status scheme is being, is being designed the other way around. It is being designed to be a scheme that helps people to prove that they have the right to stay, that is designed to actually work with um, those people who are in the UK as EU citizens to ensure that they can be documented. Uh, and you know, I think it's right that the mistakes um, that, that, that were made over the, the, the Windrush generation have been acknowledged uh, and um, although I have to say Amber Rudd is a personal friend and someone I've known for a very long time and I respect greatly, uh, I think in, in the circumstances um, she, she was right to resign over the way in which that had been um, handled. Um, but it's something that what we now need to ensure is that we don't create problems of that sort for the future. 
Uh, and therefore, having a scheme which is designed to help people to get the documentation they need to prove their um, long-term residence, I think, is the right approach. I think it's also right that we've looked at ways in which we can improve that over the current EU permanent residency scheme, which is its equivalent. Um, because uh, the, people have talked about the 82-page forms, um, the, the, the problems people have had uh, with that. People have talked about the um, problem of people having to prove that they've got health insurance, even though they've got access to the NHS, which is, um, I, I think, a particularly uh, ludicrous aspect of, of that policy. We, we, we've removed those from um, the uh, settled status scheme, and we really are what trying to work with the widest possible range of groups um, in the across the UK to make sure that they have a real say in informing how it all works. So I'm confident we're taking the right approach on this, uh, and you know, I will continue to work very, very closely um, with colleagues at the Home Office to make sure that, that we're joined up in our approach to make sure it's about how, how we make sure that people actually do have and prove that legal right. But has any extra capacity been built into the Home Office to be able to deal with all these applications? And also, I suppose, um, does that also mean, based on your response as well, that there'll be, well, almost two tiers of migrants in the country then? So you'll have a hostile uh, environment for people from out with the EU, but a non-hostile environment for people that have come from the EU? Uh, no, Do we no. have a separate system there? I mean, I think, I, I think it's very important to, to draw the distinction there between the um, the whole debate about a hostile environment, which you know, has taken place under successive governments, um, is one which is about um, illegal immigration. Um, it is not about legal immigration, whether that's EU or non-EU um, mi migration. Uh, and um, the, the focus needs to be on how we make sure that those EU citizens who've made their homes here, who've come here legally under the EU free movement rules, which remain in place in this country until the end of the implementation period, um, are able to um, continue their lives uh, legally. The government should be doing everything in its power to help them with that. And, and that's absolutely what we will um, continue to uh, focus uh, on on doing. Uh, I do think um, one of the things with the um, the whole debate about immigration that we've had um, in this country over recent years um, has been the concern that many people have in communities up and down the country um, that there is simply no control um, when it comes to um, the freedom of movement rules and that side of things. And I think one of the things we have to show for the future and for our future system is that there is a degree of control uh, in that respect. And actually, I think that could improve um, the um, at attitude um, of the Home Office and indeed government in general towards people who are coming legally uh, from both beyond the EU uh, and that side and remove some of the um, stigma and some of the pressure uh, on the immigration debate. Having, having personally um, you know, made the positive case for immigration during the referendum debate, one of the great problems I had and one of the things I was constantly confronted with by constituents was the but you have no control argument. Uh, I think we do need to address that actually in order to improve the atmosphere um, with regards to uh, the positive benefits that immigration can bring uh, to the whole country in general. But I think that that's something that is already recognised in Scotland. I think you're, the way, what you've intimated there, I think that's more a, an attitude that is reflective elsewhere in the UK because where the government published a report here about the benefits of immigration and why we need... Uh, well, we preferably like to see the continuation of the free movement of people because we rely on the inward movement of people for our own population growth. Uh, and that brings me to Scotland in particular, um, because the, there was a recent interim report published by the Migration Advisory Committee, which had very little to say about Scotland, and I'd be wondering why that is. Are we still waiting on that element to come, and is that work ongoing at the, mom at the moment? That I mean, I might start on that. But that work is ongoing. Um, the, the, the interim report um, is exactly what it says. It's an interim report. The Migration Advisory Committee have taken the view consistently that immigration, uh, which is a, a reserve matter, does need to be looked at on a UK-wide basis. Uh, but I think it's very important that the evidence from um, Scottish stakeholders, Scottish businesses and Scottish communities is taken into account in that respect. And I certainly, I've been to meet with, uh, for instance, the Fife Growers um, to talk to them about their reliance on seasonal workers and how we can make sure that that is understood 
um, by the Migration Advisory Committee and that they are taking that into account in their work. Uh, I think it's you know, the, the same issues that affect them um, also affect businesses in the Vale of Evesham and near my constituency in Worcestershire, um, which uh, are, are very involved in, in, in fruit picking in another part of the UK. So I think there's a, there's a perfectly rational argument for a consistent approach across the United Kingdom, but it is really important that it should take into account uh, those areas uh, all over the United Kingdom which have a different demographic pressure, areas in remote and rural areas um, and where the, the population is ageing. Yeah, just to confirm that, I mean, it, that was very much an interim report from the Migration mm -hmm. uh, Advisory Committee and, and most of it just set out the parameters of what uh, they were doing. We're expecting a full uh, report later in the year so that we can move forward with an, an immigration policy that is evidence-based because that is what they are about. Uh, and you know, I can f confirm you're probably aware, I mean, the Scottish Government did submit a very significant uh, document. A lot of other Scottish stakeholders uh, have done uh, so as well. I, I suppose I also have a concern because the impacts of Brexit are already starting to hit areas. I, am, I, I represent Angus Northern Mairns, which is a rural constituency, and uh, in farms across Angus that are expected to, be, to see 15 to 20 percent shortages in the number of seasonal staff that they have working, and that's for this coming season. I'm just wondering what work the government is undertaking to, to mitigate against that impact and the impact that it's already having uh, on people in Scotland. Well, I think part of the answer to that is the completion of the Migration Advisory Committee work. It needs to take into account the, um, the, the different sectors of the economy which rely on, uh, on different um, workforces. And um, uh, obviously, you know, it was the case until relatively recently that we had specific seasonal agricultural workers schemes. Uh, those were removed because free, uh, the free movement rules meant that they weren't necessary. I think it is one of the areas that the Migration Advisory Committee needs to look at. Um, but uh, I, one thing I, I, I would observe is, is that um, where I've had conversations with stakeholders about um, the, the seasonal workers, uh, in some uh, in, in many cases, they, they're actually now already becoming from beyond the EU because changes in currency, changes in the domestic economy of some of those EU member states from which people have come from traditionally uh, have meant that um, it is less attractive uh, for people to ne come, come here and send money home. And so uh, I was quite struck in meeting some of the growers' organisations by the number of Ukrainians uh, who were um, ta ta taking part in these activities who, of course, are not covered under European free movement rules. Um, the concern has been expressed by organisations such as the Three Million, I'm sure you'll be uh, aware of them, about an immigration exemption in the Data Protection Bill which would deny people access to their data and that would affect everyone currently involved in an immigration case or those who may apply for settled status in the future if they become involved in it and, uh, while they're applying for settled status. Um, can you update the committee on the status of that exemption and whether that has been removed? I think I have to write back to you on that, I'm afraid, because I'm not cited on that particular issue on today's for today's appearance, but I'm very happy to write back to you on that because obviously we had a debate on the Data Protection Bill yesterday um, in Parliament and um, there will be further progress on, on, on that as we go through the, um, the, the, the stages. So perhaps I can uh, check with my colleagues at the, 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 the Department of Culture, Media and Sport who are leading on that okay, and write back to you. Yeah, that would be of great interest. Uh, this committee has done a lot of work and commissioned quite a lot of research on immigration, so that would be much okay. appreciated. Thank you. Ross Greer wanted to come back in. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, just going back to the previous exchange about uh, Customs Union, uh, one point that uh, didn't cover it, that was, um, as Mr Mandel highlighted, uh, this is ultimately a decision for the Cabinet. Um, as Scotland's representative in the Cabinet, it would be useful to have on record your view, Mr Mandel, between the Customs Partnership and the Max FAC option. I uh, want to uh, consider, uh, as you would expect me to, uh, the options, because as I've said to you, it's ve this is very, very important uh, that we get it right and that we have uh, an arrangement. When we have an arrangement agreed within the Cabinet, uh, then uh, I will abide by the usual rules of Cabinet uh, collective responsibility and support the decision that the Cabinet makes. The Brexit vote was two years ago. The decision to activate Article 50 was uh, just over a year ago. What information do you not have yet that means you are still having to consider your position? Some of your colleagues have rehearsed their positions in public to a significant extent. Well, firstly, I, I, I don't feel that it is appropriate for cabinet ministers to re rehearse their positions in public. Uh, and uh, the, the, the position for cabinet ministers is to, 
debate uh, and discuss around the table and then uh, to uh, respect collective responsibility uh, when a decision has been made. We've worked uh, against a timetable uh, which was the wish of the EU in terms of the different parts uh, of the arrangements for leaving the EU. So as, as uh, Robin has set out, we uh, concluded the withdrawal agreement at the, at the December uh, Council, or at least the, uh, the, the basis of that. And then we ha we've put a huge effort, obviously, into uh, securing the implementation uh, period, which I think, and, and uh, support some of the points that Stuart McMillan was raising, the importance of that uh, certainty. So it's only in that period that the, the focus uh, um, ha has been on uh, the issue of the uh, uh, customs union in, in that sense of being able to have a direct dialogue uh, with the EU. Uh, as I say, a lot of work is currently being done to uh, build on the work that was set out in the, uh, in, in the initial paper, and I want to see uh, that work uh, and then take part in the, the discussion which will determine ultimately uh, what the outcome is. Yeah, supplementary on this topic from Richard Walker. Yeah, I was Richard Lockhead, I seem determined. <laughs> Name today, Richard, sorry. I was wanting to ask a similar question to, to Ross Greer, and just to follow on from his question, uh, you've had two years to make representations on what's the best customs arrangement for Scotland. So what are your views on what the best customs arrangements are for Scotland? Well, my, uh, my view is that the best arrangements for Scotland is to have uh, as frictionless as arrangement uh, as uh, is possible uh, with uh, the minimum of, of tariff and intervention. That's the outcome that we want to get to in uh, these discussions. And what will your position be that's not the outcome agreed at Cabinet due to certain individuals in the Cabinet taking an alternative view to what you're asking for? I think uh, that we will. Uh, as we've demonstrated in these other key areas, be able to reach agreement. Only months ago, people were saying that we would never be able to get uh, collective or parliamentary agreement as to what uh, the effective divorce bill uh, would be, that we wouldn't be able to get agreement uh, on, a, um, on an implementation period and the operation of that implementation period. These things have been achieved because uh, when it comes uh, down to uh, it, these are really, really serious issues where, as you indicate, the interests of Scotland and the United Kingdom have to come first and not individual uh, political positions. Thank you. Uh, just in conclusion on, on, that, um, on that topic, um, you talk about uh, the progress that you say you've made on the withdrawal agreement and, and Mr Walker early spoke about uh, how in June you'll move on to talking about the future economic partnership. But when Mr Barney spoke in Ireland last month, he was very clear that uh, without uh, an agreement on the Northern Irish border, which means you have to settle your customs issues, without that agreement, uh, there would be no withdrawal agreement and without a withdrawal agreement, you're not going to be able to talk about the future economic partnership. So if there's no deal on customs, there's no deal on Ireland, it means there's no deal. Now, that's crazy. Uh, well, we all want to make sure that we reach a comprehensive um, agreement on the withdrawal agreement, on the legal text of that. Uh, and that includes um, the elements of the joint report referring to um, Northern Ireland. And, and of course, there are different positions being taken uh, as to the exact drafting of that. Um, and, and those need to be, to, to, to be reconciled and reach an agreement. But where I'd slightly disagree with you um, is in terms of saying you have to have reached your full agreement on customs in order to do that. It's actually the Commission themselves that have uh, made sure that we weren't able to talk about the detail of customs uh, up until this stage. Uh, we were very keen to open that conversation earlier. And so we are very keen um, to progress with both. Um, but the timetable for reaching a full 
uh, agreement line by line on the legal text of the withdrawal agreement is for October. Uh, and uh, we, we want to ensure that alongside that, at fitting the words of Article 50 itself, uh, we have as much detail as possible on the future framework for the economic partnership between the UK uh, and the EU. So we are very keen to press on with both. Officials have been meeting in Brussels on a regular basis to take forward uh, that discussion on the, the withdrawal agreement text. And we are absolutely committed to all elements of the joint report to date. Now, at that, of course, the wording to which the Prime Minister objected um, on creating a border in the Irish Sea, effectively, um, was, was wording that went beyond the joint report and was one interpretation of it that we've made very clear is not acceptable to us. Uh, and so we need to reach agreement on an alternative to that. Uh, that's where the talks are right now, and, and we're pressing ahead in, in to do that in order to make sure we can get the maximum progress, both ahead of June Council, but also, crucially, ahead of the, the full final withdrawal agreement yeah. being there in October. In, in those official discussions that you are talking about, reports from those official discussions say that the, the EU has systematically annihilated both your customs options. I don't think we should pay too much attention well, to media reports. I mean, I think well, we've, we, we've got to focus on uh, getting the detail right uh, in these uh, uh, arrangements. Uh, we've put forward um, two detailed proposals um, on, on customs. Um, we, we haven't yet had the broad conversation about customs that we would like to have, um, with the EU, but we want to get on with that as quickly as possible. Mm. Well, certainly the, these reports are, are, are pretty credible. I mean, pl places like the Financial Times, for example, uh, perhaps uh, more reliable than some of this, the, the briefings that come out of the UK government. If it is the case that your customs options have been systematically annihilated uh, by the EU, uh, then where do you go other than to remain within the customs union? Uh, I think the, uh, the key thing is to actually negotiate, get the okay. negotiations right in the room, and, and not to speculate on media reporting. Okay, thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. I'll now suspend the meeting and move into private session.